Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day number 230, and we've got three chapters here in Jeremiah to look at as Jerusalem comes to an end. And we have two psalms as well that fit into this spot on our timeline. So it's going to be a busy day of reading, but we need to pray before we begin. Today's prayer comes from the book The Valley of Vision by Arthur Bennett. It's entitled, God's Cause. Your cause, not my own, engages my heart, and I appeal to you with greatest freedom to set up your kingdom in every place where Satan reigns. Glorify yourself, and I will rejoice, for to bring honor to your name is my sole desire. I adore you that you are God, and I long that others should know it, feel it, and rejoice it. Oh, that all men might love and praise you, that you might have all glory from the world of mankind. Let sinners be brought to you for your dear name. To the eye of reason, everything regarding the conversion of others is as dark as midnight. But you can accomplish great things. The cause is yours, and it is to your glory that men should be saved. Lord, use me as you will. Do with me what you will. But, oh, advance your cause. Let your kingdom come. Let your blessed cause be advanced in this world. Oh, do gather great numbers to Jesus. Let me see that glorious day and help me to seek for multitudes of souls. Let me be willing to die to that end. And while I live, let me labor for you to the utmost of my strength, spending time profitably in this work, both in health and in weakness. It is your cause and kingdom that I long for, not my own. Oh, please, grant my request. We also want to pray today for the Bengali people. Now, you might expect me to say uh, in Bangladesh or in India, but we want to focus on the 350,000 native Bengalis living in Great Britain. That's right, there are 350,000 people in a people group that is tucked away in England, and they are completely unreached with the good news of Jesus Christ. Most Bengali speakers in the UK have been somewhat absorbed culturally in the UK. Some immigrated to escape the harsh lifestyles of Bangladesh, while others have come in search of better educational or economic opportunities. Yet most retain their traditional Islamic religion as a cultural anchor. Despite the abundance of Christians and churches in the UK, Muslims remain unreached. Muslim communities in the UK are highly organized. They feel that they have already sacrificed their languages and their cultures, thus they really don't want to lose their religion as well. And to be honest, UK Christians have been apathetic or fearful of witnessing to Muslims. It might take the efforts of believers from other parts of the world to reach these UK Bengalis. We pray for openness and spiritual awakening, leading to genuine responses to the Savior. We pray that this would be the decade when there is a movement to Christ among the Muslim Bengalis in the UK. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, five chapters of reading ahead of us. Are you ready? Let's do it. Jeremiah chapter 38. Now Shephathiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malkiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war, and live. 
Thus says the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, and be taken. Then the official said to the king, Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in this city, and the hands of all the people, by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank in the mud. When Ebedmelech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern, the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Ebedmelech went from the king's house and said to the king, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into the cistern, and he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Then the king commanded Ebedmelech the Ethiopian, Take thirty men with you from here, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebedmelech took the men with him, and went to the house of the king, to a wardrobe in the storehouse, and took from there old rags and worn-out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. Then Ebedmelech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and received him at the third entrance of the temple of the Lord. The king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you counsel, you will not listen to me. Then King Zedekiah swore secretly to Jeremiah, As the Lord lives, who made our souls, I will not put you to death, or deliver you into the hand of these men who seek your life. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But... If you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans, lest I be handed over to them and they deal cruelly with me. Jeremiah said, You shall not be given to them. Obey now the voice of the Lord and what I say to you, and it shall be well with you and your life shall be spared. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the vision which the Lord has shown to me. Behold, all the women left in the house of the king of Judah were being led out to the officials of the king of Babylon, and were saying, Your trusted friends have deceived you and prevailed against you. Now that your feet are sunk in the mud, they turn away from you. All your wives and your sons shall be led out to the Chaldeans, and you yourself shall not escape from their hand, but shall be seized by the king of Babylon, and this city shall be burned with fire. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. If the officials hear that I have spoken with you, and come to you and say to you, Tell us what you said to the king, and what the king said to you, hide nothing from us, and we will not put you to death. Then you shall say to them, I made a humble plea to the king, that he would not send me back to the house of Jonathan to die there. Then all the officials came to Jeremiah and asked him, and he answered them as the king had instructed him. So they stopped speaking with him, for the conversation had not been overheard. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard until the day that Jerusalem was taken. Chapter 39 In the ninth year of Zedekiah king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, a breach was made in the city. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate. Nergal Sarezer of Samgar, Nebuchadnezzar Sarsechim, the Rabsaris, 
Nergal Sarezer the Rabmag, with all the rest of the officers of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah king of Judah and all the soldiers saw them, they fled, going out of the city at night by the way of the king's garden, through the gate between the two walls. And they went toward the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them, and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes, and the king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. The Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him and the people who remained. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owed nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, Nebuchadnezzar, the Rabsaris, Nergal Sarezer, the Rabmag, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. They entrusted him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, that he should take him home. So he lived among the people. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to Abedmelech the Ethiopian, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. Chapter 40 The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah, when he took him bound in chains, along with all the captives of Jerusalem and Judah, who were being exiled to Babylon. The captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God pronounced this disaster against this place. The Lord has brought it about, and has done as he said. Because you sinned against the Lord, and did not obey his voice, this thing has come upon you. Now behold, I release you today from the chains on your hands. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look after you well. But if it seems wrong to you to come with me to Babylon, do not come. See, the whole land is before you. Go wherever you think it good and right to go. If you remain, then return to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon appointed governor of the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people. Or, go wherever you think it right to go. So the captain of the guard gave him an allowance of food and a present, and let him go. Then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, at Mitzpah, and lived with him among the people who were left in the land. When all the captains of the forces in the open country and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, governor in the land, and had committed to him men, women, and children, those of the poorest of the land who had not been taken into exile to Babylon, they went to Gedaliah at Mitzpah, Ishmael the son of Nethaniah, Jehanan the son of Kareah, Saraiah the son of Tanhumeth, the sons of Ephi the Netophathite, Jezaniah the son of the Maacathite, they and their men. Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. As for me, I will dwell at Mitzpah to represent you before the Chaldeans, who will come to us. But as for you, gather wine and summer fruits and oil, and store them in your vessels, and dwell in your cities that you have taken. Likewise, when all the Judeans who were in Moab and among the Ammonites and in Edom and in the other lands heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant in Judah and had appointed Gedaliah the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, as governor over them, 
Then all the Judeans returned from all the places to which they had been driven, and came to the land of Judah, to Gedaliah at Mitzpah. And they gathered wine and summer fruits in great abundance. Now Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the leaders of the forces in the open country, came to Gedaliah at Mitzpah, and said to him, Do you know that Baalis, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to take your life? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, would not believe him. Then Johanan the son of Kareah spoke secretly to Gedaliah at Mitzpah, Please, let me go and strike down Ishmael the son of Nethaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he take your life, so that all the Judeans who are gathered about you would be scattered, and the remnant of Judah would perish? But Gedaliah the son of Ahikam said to Johanan the son of Kareah, You shall not do this thing, for you are speaking falsely of Ishmael. Psalm 74 a masculine of Asaph. O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees, and all its carved wood they broke down with hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. They said to themselves, We will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, and there is none among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff, is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Yet God my King is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might, you broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs, and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have regard for the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. Do not forget the clamor of your foes, the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. Psalm 79, a psalm of Asaph. O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heaven for food, the flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem. And there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. How long, O Lord? Will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you, and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob, and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you, according to your great power. Preserve those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors the taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord. 
but we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. looking for encouragement for life's journey, a better understanding of the Bible, or an honest look at Scripture, check out the Christ-Centered Journey. I'm your host, Dan Shipton, and I'd like to invite you to check us out. Mondays through Fridays, we air new programs. It's a daily podcast that's built around building one another up as Christ followers in this journey we call life. So why don't you join us by looking us up on your podcasting host, for the Christ-centered journey. In chapter 38, some believe that we are seeing another account of Jeremiah's time in the dungeon from chapter 37, and there are a lot of similarities between the two chapters. In both of them, Jeremiah was arrested and imprisoned. Both mention confinement in the house of Jonathan. Both describe a secret meeting between King Zedekiah and Jeremiah in which the content of the prophet's message was essentially the same. And both accounts conclude with Jeremiah's confinement in the court of the guard. However, there are some differences in the two accounts that mean that it could be a continuation of the story with two different but similar events. Those differences include the reason and timing of the arrest, and the name of the location of Jeremiah's imprisonment. Chapter 38 also contains a detailed account of Jeremiah's rescue from the cistern that's not mentioned in chapter 37. This is one of those cases where we really don't know, because the evidence is right in the middle, and while you can pick a side, we really can't eliminate the other option. With that being said, I think that this is a continuation of the story, and the group approached King Zedekiah about what Jeremiah was saying while he was already imprisoned in the courtyard. After Zedekiah shows his spineless character and hands Jeremiah over to them, they drop him down a cistern, which reminds me of Joseph being thrown down a well by his brothers. However, Jeremiah's rescue would come from an unlikely source. Ebedmelech, an Ethiopian. To me, it's ironic and telling that none of Jeremiah's own people cared enough about him to try to rescue him. That effort was left to a foreigner. He approached the king in the courtyard and got permission to rescue Jeremiah, and Zedekiah sent 30 men to help, probably to turn aside anyone would try to fight this new reverse verdict by the king. However, there's no word about any protests or fighting over this. Jeremiah was lifted up, and he remained imprisoned in the courtyard of the guard. Then, Jeremiah was taken to Zedekiah for a secret meeting. This seems very familiar to the meeting in chapter 37. As Zedekiah begins, he says, I'm going to ask you a question. But you might have noticed that he never actually gets around to asking a question. Instead, Zedekiah promises that as long as Jeremiah tells the truth, no harm will come to him. Reassured by the king's word, Jeremiah told Zedekiah again that the only way to save the city and his own life and that of his family was to surrender to the Babylonians. The message and its options had not changed. It was a message that had already caused Jeremiah much personal suffering, but he had no other choice but to declare it again. Zedekiah gets real with Jeremiah, and he tells him that he's afraid for his life. Foreign enemies loved to display the heads of their conquered kings on the outskirts of the city as a warning. Well, Jeremiah reassured Zedekiah this time, and he made one last plea to obey God and go out to the army, and his life would be spared. If he doesn't, all of his wives and children would be given to the Babylonians, and the city would be burnt down. These are the final words recorded between Jeremiah and Zedekiah before the fall actually happens in the next chapter. Chapter 39, we see some of the details of that fall of Jerusalem in 587 and 586 BC. It was 
an event of such magnitude that the dates of the beginning of the siege and the final fall of the city are carefully preserved in these verses as well as other scripture passages. Later in Jeremiah, as well as Second Kings 25, which we will read tomorrow, and Ezekiel also record these dates, even including the start date of the tenth of the month. This account doesn't communicate the terror that was happening inside the city. The siege was only ended because the people finally gave up after resorting to such heinous things as cannibalism. Zedekiah was not ready for all of this, so he runs away. But the Babylonians pursued him and they arrested him. He was forced to watch as his sons were executed, and then he was blinded so that his dead sons would be the last thing he saw. This is absolutely horrible. Jeremiah is still stuck in his prison, and the Babylonians come to him specifically. It looks like he's going to be arrested and carried to Babylon, but then, on the way, one of the Babylonian officials lets Jeremiah go free, and Jeremiah chooses to return to Mitzpah, where Gedaliah is, to help him rebuild the nation. The decision should have silenced the accusations of those that said that Jeremiah was a collaborator with the Babylonians against his own people. Well, after the Babylonians left Gedaliah in charge, hundreds began licking their collective wounds, and then they moved back to Judea. The appointment of one of their own people as governor gave them confidence about the future, they were able to harvest an abundance of wine and summer fruit, which would see them through the first year until crops could be planted and harvested again on a regular basis. However, just as life appeared to be returning to normal, a terrible tragedy occurred. Chapter 40 offers a warning of this tragedy and an offhand dismissal. We don't know much about the assassins besides what is listed. But Gedaliah refused to believe the plot against his life. Why he felt no concern can't really be understood, but his refusal cost him his life. Perhaps he had a trusting nature and was unwilling to believe the worst about a man whom he already knew and considered to be a friend. Think about Julius Caesar and his assassin Brutus. However, we'll have to wait a couple of days before we see the details of this assassination. As we close today, the two psalms that we looked at appear to be strongly connected to the events in 2 Kings 25, which we will read tomorrow. To review, in January of 588 BC, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon besieged Jerusalem. On July 26, 586 BC, they broke down the wall. On August 16th, 1586, they burned down every important building in Jerusalem, including the temple and royal palaces which had stood for 400 years. Following this, 72 leaders were executed, and all this made Israel an object of scorn in the surrounding nations. Looking at Psalm 74, we see Asaph lament over the destruction of the sanctuary by an enemy, and he appealed to God for help by showing his right hand, which is a symbol of his power. He reminded him of the past when he helped Israel across the Red Sea, and his power over nature. He also referred to having crushed Leviathan, a seven-headed monster that symbolized Egypt's power. He finally appealed to God to consider the covenant and that his name was being spurned because of the triumph of the pagan enemy. In chapter 79, this psalm of Asaph is an appeal to God not to remember their sins and to deliver them for the glory of his name. The psalmist sees the destruction of God's people as a blot on his reputation. In ancient times, when a nation conquered another nation, it was proof that its gods were stronger than the gods of the conquered nation. Asaph knew this was not true and did not want God's name dishonored. If God would answer, his people would praise him forever. 
God had chosen Babylon to chasten Judah for her sins. But Asaph was more burdened about how Babylon had slandered God's good name. Now God did answer Asaph's prayer because the Persians conquered Babylon in October 539 BC. Then King Cyrus of Persia issued a proclamation in 538 BC that allowed the Israelites to return to Judah and rebuild their temple. The sons of Asaph were among those who returned to praise the Lord in Ezra and Nehemiah. So I can't even begin to imagine the utter despair of being a resident of Jerusalem like Asaph and seeing the temple that had stood there for centuries burned to the ground. But instead of crying out against God in this moment of despair, I want us to focus and to understand that in the midst of trials and hardships and destruction, we need to be like Asaph. When we are outraged by tragedy, we need to cry out to God, not against him. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash dbrpodcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading and keep worshiping.